This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 442, recorded on May 19th, 2017. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hello, everybody. How you doing? I'm doing well. Rich, did you like the uh, Easter egg on last week's episode? I did very much. I'm only disappointed that there isn't uh, a lot of follow-up commenting on how <laughs> cute Harper is. Nobody she really anything. does have a she really does have a great voice, doesn't she? Great voice. Very yeah. I just wish we had her say that you know another twiv is viral. Yeah. That would have well, been. we'll get her another time. Uh, so it's, what uh, you got? it's eight, excuse me. What do you got in weather? Uh, I got uh, eighty-seven degrees, partly cloudy. That's eighty-seven degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, and I'll have to convert that for you here. But it's thirty-three uh, Celsius uh, here. Is that what it is? Oh, which is probably uh, high eighty. Sure. What did I say? Eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That translates to thirty. 30 Celsius, 30.5. You mean it's hotter there? Yeah, New York's been hot these last three days. Yep. No kidding. Yep. Really hot and humid. That's Typical. what we got. All of a sudden, Good. boom, it got hot. Man. Also there. joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. How you uh, doing we had there? that hot weather, so just wait because today here it's 51 Fahrenheit, He's 11 kidding. Celsius. You're kidding. Yeah, wow. yesterday it was oh, in the man. 80s. Let's see what it's going to do tomorrow. I didn't know it was going to get cold again. Well, it might. Let's see. Um, yeah, Saturday 19. Wow. Mm-hmm. Sunday 17. Monday 21. Wow. It's just more normal for this time of year. Mm-hmm. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's also hotter than Texas here. It's 88, <laughs> 88 Fahrenheit, 31C. And uh, it was even hotter yesterday. It was it was in the mid-90s that's, Fahrenheit. That's a sum- Blazing. Yeah. Hotter than Texas. That's something, uh, Yeah, I right? know. That's I like that. Sense. Hotter <laughs> than Texas. Yeah, I guess we're going to get, you know, the weather weather patterns here are slightly different than than what you guys get. I think we get some influence of the Gulf right, mm-hmm. uh, pushing mm-hmm. things north. So it's going to cool off a little bit in the next few days, but not like you guys are going to get. It's yeah. not like we yeah. get the same fronts really no. No, we don't. ramming through. Okay. All right. We have a guest in studio today. He has uh, braved the hot streets of Manhattan to come up here. He is a freelance science journalist and director of New Right, Tim Requarth. Welcome to TWIF, Tim. Thank you for having me. How far did you have to come? I came from Brooklyn. I figured you were going to come from Brooklyn, yeah. Yeah. All the writers are in Brooklyn, right? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) They got priced out of Manhattan. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's about an hour. Uh, it's about an hour journey here from from Brooklyn. So yeah, I had a student once who lived in Brooklyn, and she complained that it was yeah, it's too, it's an hour. Yeah, but um, most of the time you stay home, right? Right there. Yeah, I do mostly mostly at home. All right. Yeah, well, my office is in my bedroom. So. <laughs> yes. Well, we we have you. We'll talk about what, why we have you here in a moment. I want to tell uh, uh, the listeners about the Journal of Microbiology and biology education. They're now accepting submissions for a science communication themed issue that explores evaluation and impact of various forms of science communication, understanding cognitive biases related to scientific topics, and encouraging engagement in science-based dialogues and more. The deadline to submit an article is August 7th. You can meet the guest editor team and learn more at asmscience.org slash jmbe. It's right up your alley, right? Yeah, Have so. you ever heard of the Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education? Probably not. Uh, no. So they usually publish papers on education in the field of microbiology, hmm. and now they're doing a science communication-themed issue. Everyone's jumping on the bandwagon. That's interesting, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rich, what's ha- what happened last Sunday? Last Sunday, I'm sorry I didn't uh, wasn't sort of current enough to catch this for the last episode, mm-hmm. but last Sunday marked on my calendar was smallpox vaccination day. Uh, so uh, Jenner's really critical uh, experiment, which was vaccinating James Phipps, mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. happened on May 14th in 1796. <laughs> uh, and so there's a, I put a link in here to this day in history uh, that describes the event. And I looked cool. up if I could find a link to smallpox vaccination day, because I know that that is a thing that people talk about, but I couldn't find a formal one. At any rate, this will work. It's a celebratory kind of thing, because we don't, we don't need people to come out and be vaccinated anymore. Uh, for small, no. Not for smallpox, anyway. That's right. Actually, Anthony had sent in uh, two links related. He sent in uh, the birthday of... Edward Jenner, which was May 17th, 1749. Right. So the in terms of calendar days, that's just three days after smallpox vaccination. Yeah. Day. yeah. yeah. And he also sent in the article on uh, smallpox vaccin- vaccination day, 14th of May, the father of immunology. His work is said to have saved more lives than the work of any other human. That's believable. That? But there are a couple of others I might put on a, on a very short list with him. Let's take the opposite tack. Who has killed more lives than any other? Oh, oh man, I don't even want to go there. <laughs> no, let's not even think about that. I don't even want to go there. Okay. No, but I'd put, I'd put. Um, well, you could, ar- you might argue that Maurice Hilleman wouldn't have existed without Jenner, but um, I'd certainly put him up there uh, and Norman Borlaug. Right. So the uh, uh, this uh, the links that. Anthony sent to, mm-hmm. there's a Royal, Royal Society has a Facebook page, which looks pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah. on that Facebook page uh, with these links is a uh, an illustration of somebody's arm with a vaccination on it. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to point out that that picture yeah, is right it. out of Jenner's publication. That's right. right. Uh, it's not I James. I looked at, yeah, it's not James Phipps. It's a couple of cases later that he wanted to illustrate. Uh, but that came right out of Jenner's, uh, Jenner's inquiry. So I have a copy so of go. it here, which looks like it came from a library. I don't know who gave it to me. This is not from 1796 department of public no. health, 437 West 59th street, Columbia university. Wow. This sure is one what, of these nice, nice leather bound things in the original type no, and stuff. No, it's just falling apart. But this is when Columbia was down on 47th Street, uh, 59th mm. Street. Wow, it's a long time ago. This is a reprint. Uh, inquiry into the causes and effects of the variola vaccine. Oh. A disease, we, a disease, we talked about on, we, we covered this. Yeah, as we, a, we did like a TWIV. That was a, did. that was a, that was a Vinceless TWIV, I think. I'm not right. done with the title, you know. I'm still. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So the whole title is An Inquiry into the Causes and Effects of the Variola Vaccine, a disease discovered in some of the western countries, counties of England, particularly Gloucestershire, and known by the name of the cowpox. Clearly no one told him how to make a name of a book, mm-hmm. right? I think that was a fairly popular thing in those days to have a very, very elaborate descriptive title. And all the S's are F's. Of course. <laughs> uh, makes it really cool. hard. makes it really <laughs> yes. hard to read. All right, so much for smallpox. Uh, now, Tim, the reason you're here is a uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, all of us, uh, no, Kathy didn't, but the rest of the crew uh, went to, to Washington for the science march. Mm-hmm. And the day before, we did a, um, a podcast at the headquarters of the American Society for Microbiology, mm-hmm. us all being microbiologists. Mm-hmm. Yep. And um, someone had sent us a letter with a link to your article in Slate. Hmm. And by the way, we should reiterate that the reason Kathy wasn't there was that she was in New Haven getting an award for being awesome. That's right. <laughs> well, so, the, or the, being a science journalist. Yes. Neither of which I totally <laughs> claim to be awesome or a science journalist. The awesome awards. I like those. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. So your, your Slate article, Scientists Stop Thinking, Explaining Science Will Fix Things. And actually, I was reading it on the train on the way down to uh, Washington. I said, I have to get Tim on. You were from Columbia. And so I said, this has got to be easy for us to get together. So we thought we'd talk about it. But I want to first learn a little bit about you. Um, where are you from? Are you from New York originally? Uh, no, I'm actually from a dying industrial town in the Midwest, um, Decatur, <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> Decatur. Oh. Mm-hmm. But it could be revived as something else. You know, these, these towns get built up and they're cheap uh, housing and so forth. But, I, I sure hope so. Eh. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was mostly involved in growing corn there. Um, it's involved, I would say in processing corn and soybeans so you've got the head of archer daniel midland which is a big Ah, so it's Mm. it's it had firestone and caterpillar and it's it's more of a factory town um surrounded by farmland 
Did you go to high school there as well? I did go to high school there. And college? Uh, Northwestern. I moved up to Chicago. Chicago, Mm -hmm. right. Northwestern. That's is that in Evanston? Yeah, there's a campus in Evanston, Evanston. and one the, in Chicago. So you went to the Chicago campus. Uh, the undergrads in Evanston, Evanston, right. and then um, medical school, law school, I think, are in Chicago. Yeah, I know one virologist in Evanston. But that's Bob Lamb. Mm-hmm. I've been there once. So at that point, were you a science major? Uh, no, actually, I majored in the unlikely field of Spanish literature. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, which I thought was going to make me billions so that's of dollars, a quixotic, but quixotic choice. <laughs> yeah, haha. Ha. Um, I had to read that book three times. Uh, <laughs> it, it was. Uh, I also um, uh, did a lot of uh, writing. Uh, uh-huh. I did the creative writing uh, program there, where we had to write a small novel, and uh, was a columnist for the paper. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was pretty much in the in the humanities. Uh, well, look, I have to tell you, uh, Carl Zimmer was a. English major at Yale mm-hmm. and uh, Harold Varmus, the Nobel laureate, was a uh, was what did he major in? Does anyone remember? Uh, English literature I, or something? I think, I think it's it, English. Yeah. I think that's right. Yeah, and so, what, wasn't his focus on Faulkner? Hmm. I think don't remember. But yeah, we'd have to go back to that episode. But, uh, but, you're yeah. in good company. Great. So when you yeah. graduated, what uh, was your next step? Um, I was sort of a jack of all trades, master of none. I did a lot of odd jobs. Uh, I actually worked as a musician for a while. I, I, I play and, uh, um, what do you play? Uh, piano and guitar, um, oh, cool. various others. Uh, and then it, it was actually, um, what got me into, uh, I did my, my PhD in neuroscience and right here, right mm-hmm, here at Columbia. Yeah. And what got me into that was a family member who had dementia. Mm. Um, and I sort of started off by reading, you know, popular science writing about it, um, books about it and thought, Hey, I'd like to get in the lab and see what this is, mm-hmm. what this is all about. So I worked in a dementia lab and then eventually went back to school, did a master's in, um, studying fly genetics at Northwestern and then came over to Columbia. Okay. That's interesting. So you, you uh, spent a couple of years after graduating working yeah. in a lab and, and to getting a master's and you came here. How did you pick uh, Columbia? Um, I mean, it was, uh, it's got a fantastic assortment of neuroscientists. Yeah, um, uh, they accepted me. Um, so that helps. Yeah, I That's, think I was the last. That was choice. high on my list. Yeah, <laughs> I'm. I'm pretty certain I was the, the last choice. I was not on the starting team, but I felt very uh, lucky to come here and right. had a great experience. What did you work on? I worked on electric fish. Ah, so, cool. I yeah. didn't even Who's know. Yeah. There are these bizarre fish. It's. Um, yeah. It would be great for a podcast because you can you can hear them. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but describing them is much harder. You either think they're very beautiful or very ugly. They have they're called elephant nose fish, and they have oh. a little um, what looks like a uh, trunk, uh, and they are uh, electric fish that don't use it to stun prey, but use it to communicate with other fish and sense their surroundings. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in that sense, it's more like echolocation or sonar. Um, and so Who's those web? are uh, Nate Sautel. Okay. Yeah. And we studied um, sensory processing, how hmm. organisms tell the difference between themselves and uh, the outside world. And that was in this same building that we're in, Hammer. That was right? eight floors below this. Is he still here? Cool. Uh, yeah. Hmm. So is he going to be moving down to the Brain Institute? I believe so, yeah. yeah. It's a brand new campus being built uh, by Columbia in between the medical school and the Morningside, and it's going to have a lot of... Different things, and the first building that's been done is a uh, what is it called? Brain something and behavior. Mind, Mind brain and behavior institute. Mind yeah. brain and behavior institute. Right. Oh, wow. And Eventually, Tim, Columbia will just own Manhattan. It's getting there. <laughs> Some of these blue ones on Google Images are really pretty. Yeah. <laughs> Electric fish. Mm-hmm. The, the elephant, the elephant nose. nose. Fish, yeah. Wait, a blue one. Yeah. Found a blue there's one. Two. Tropicalfishkeeping.com and right. fishforums.com. Hmm. The ones I worked on were always black. Hmm. A bunch of yeah, black they have some the nice. yeah. So when you finished here, uh, what did you do next? Um, I was mainly working as a freelance writer. So I've been mm. working on some longer projects and doing writing on the side. And then I 
teach um, science communication workshops and courses and uh, various other odd jobs. So when you graduated, you didn't want to do research for a living. Is that did you figure that out like part way through or at the end? How yeah, that... I would say part way through. Mm-hmm. I, I figured it out. Um, it's an extremely uh, stimulating endeavor, and mm-hmm. I really had a, a wonderful experience. So it wasn't really running away from it so much as running towards writing. And I think the main thing for me was intellectual in the sense that a writer gets to engage with a broad range of topics. And uh, at least for a beginning scientist, in my observations, it's a very, very focused, and you're rehashing a lot of the same intellectual material for years, which is satisfying because you get to solve problems that other people haven't solved. And it's, it's, uh, it's not to, to denigrate it in any way, but I, I preferred a more broader engagement with science and, mm. and, um, writing was a great way for that to do that. I, I think we've talked to other science writers who've said just the same thing, I believe. Mm-hmm. I, I think you have one co-hosting the show who's ah, in a similar right. vein. Yes. <laughs> great. I, I, in your case and Alan's as well, it, you know, you went through, uh, doing science for a number of years. And I think that really helps there are a lot mm-hmm, of science sure. writers who have not. And I think mm-hmm. they, you know, they're good writers like Carl Zimmer never did any science. Right. He's a good writer, but I think, uh, if he had done some, you w- you would see it in his writing. Yeah, and I think, and in, in, in you know, um, maybe Alan can agree or disagree, but I, it's certainly not necessary yeah. to have a science background right. as someone like Carl Zimmer or mm-hmm. many other wonderful writers uh, demonstrate. But it's both a curse and a blessing. On the one mm-hmm. hand, mm-hmm. you take for you know you have to take a step back mm-hmm. and kind of recalibrate what is interesting in the world, sure. and um, uh, it does take time. Uh, to shed yourself of jargon and assumed uh, knowledge and uh, all of that. Uh, But at the same time, you have a very good understanding of how science actually works. Mm -hmm. And I think that general understanding enables you to dive into other fields, uh, I think, more efficiently and more effectively. I don't know. What do you think, Alan? I I agree mostly. Um, (laughs) I I find it made it made it a whole lot easier to go into writing about particularly fields that are where a lot of the work is um biology uh, molecular biology infectious disease public health you know that was i was already conversant in all the vocabulary of those fields so it's it allows you to communicate very easily with the people in those fields i can conduct an interview in 20 minutes that would take somebody without that background an hour to get the same mm-hmm. um information um and and in the broader sense, you know, as you say, it gives you, you you understand the day to day of what a scientist's life is like. Um, if you go far enough afield, though, I, I've actually done a couple of, um, like, I did a nanotechnology piece and uh, um, another physics thing, and and then you start to actually experience it the way people who <laughs> didn't have the science background <laughs> must come at it, um, and. Uh, you know, it's it's doable, but um, it definitely is is harder. Yeah. Whenever that, I, oops, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask you, Tim, because uh, I've heard those from Alan before. What things have you written about that are farthest from your training? Um, yeah, I was I was about to say whenever I want to feel stupid, I go try to understand macroeconomics. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I wrote an article on the origins of life. Um, a, a, a pretty in-depth one that got into a lot of physics and thermodynamics. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, of course, any scientist has a sort of foundation in that, but at the more advanced levels, it was a lot of new material. Um, and I found that to be fascinating, but it took a lot more background work. Mm-hmm. Um, I was also working on an article about, uh, it's not uh, published yet, but on um, the pharmaceutical industry and clinical trials. And that's a whole other field to understand, not just scientifically, but regulatory and yes. business. Um, so, but the skills I think that you learn as a scientist to dig into something, to not accept contradictions, to um, and and frankly, the practical skills of being able to organize and parse large amounts of knowledge uh, and materials has been extraordinarily useful in sort of navigating new fields. Yeah. It's also very useful. I, I 
heard this mentioned in the preface of a book, a, a computer programming book that I was reading years ago. Um, if you have an advanced degree in a hard science, it is kind of reassuring when you get swamped in some subject and you're feeling totally stupid. Um, and the, the writer was saying he'd, he'd known somebody who had a PhD from Caltech in physics. And the, the guy said, oh, no, you know, I, I get swamped with something and I feel totally stupid. But then I remind myself, I'm not stupid. I have a Ph.D. from Caltech in <laughs> physics. <laughs> this stuff is just hard. Um, so it's kind of reassuring because as science journalists, we frequently, especially if you go far afield of what you're doing, you, you'll find yourself looking at something and saying, this makes no sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've been exposed to enough hard material and you also have a track record of having dealt with it that you can say, okay, this is just hard material. I just need to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know that eventually I've experienced this so many times, you know, that eventually it will crystallize. Yes. And you'll have something almost akin to an aha moment, or, or at least, you, you know, you, you start to recognize the problems, you recognize the literature, and it, you become familiar with it, and it does come together. And in the moments where it's confusing leading up to it, you can remind yourself, yeah, yeah. I'll get over this. I'll get through this. Right. It'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. This idea of um, writing, opening things up rather than you go into research. It mm -hmm. focuses. That's partly why I do podcasting mm -hmm. because I get to look at stuff I'd never read. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. I worked on one virus for most of my career and read pretty much that, and now I read all kinds of things, mm -hmm. not just viruses, bacteria, parasites. It's great. It lets you do that, so I can understand that mm -hmm. that completely. Tim, when did you finish your PhD? Uh, it was about three years ago. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And you said you teach at Morningside a writing course. Um, I. I did teach a, I just finished it actually, a, like a science communication, mainly a science writing course. Um, I've done those at mm -hmm. Columbia and NYU. What school is it taught out of? Uh, the, actually, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Um, uh, okay. It's open to all PhD, it's for scientists, so it's open to all PhD students in the natural sciences. Do you know uh, Jonathan Weiner? Yeah, I would call him a friend. He's, uh, I teach, in, I give a lecture in his course on... Uh, yeah, science writing, I guess it's called, right? Yeah, so he would teach in the journalism school, yeah, which would right. not be open to the other students. And right. So that's sort of where I come in. He's been, he's going to be here on Monday. We're doing a, one of my other podcasts. We're going to oh, really? have him on for an episode. Yeah. I like John a lot. Yeah, he's a great guy. He showed up last week, and I said, what are you doing here? He said, aren't we doing a podcast? I said, no, that's next Monday. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tim, did you have any formal training in uh, science writing or writing in general? Uh, other than a very bad novella when I was 20 years old <laughs> in Northwestern, uh, no. Uh, so there must be, uh, you must have to have a certain amount of expertise in, uh, finding outlets, marketing yourself. You know, how, how do you, how did you pick that up? How do you go about it? I certainly have a lot to learn in that, in that department. So it's a very evolving world in that sense. Um, I think the traditional channels of, you know, agents, publicists, major outlets, book publishers, mm -hmm. um, is under siege by a very um, decentralized uh, social media, self-publishing, um, self-publicizing. And where you position yourself in taking advantage of the older structures, which can be useful for certain things, as well as... Uh, learning the fast moving new, newer structures. Um, I think that's the biggest, that's like the biz, biggest challenge. Um, yes. So that's something I'm currently can you, always get you've, better. At. Uh, you've managed to, uh, publish in some relatively high profile, um, uh, journals or, uh, outlets, New York times, scientific American, yeah. uh, et cetera. How, how do you get those yeah. gigs? Newsweek. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of it comes from old fashioned networking, I would say, mm -hmm. you know, you spend time in, in New York. I'm fortunate to be in New York and, uh, you, you, you spent, I've spent a lot of time in the science writing community through, through Neurite and other, um, places getting to know people. And that's sort of how one thing can lead to another, uh, which is this? Which can also be done via social media. So I don't think you really need to be limited to living in a place like New York in order to, for that to happen. 
I think the other thing, so in, in a lot of sense, um, I've, got, I've gotten very lucky. You know, people have taken chances on a relative beginner. Um, but at the same time, I also did a lot of writing for other places first and, and mm. published there and had examples that showed I could write and um, put together pitches I would hope that were convincing. You know, mm. in other words, proposals for articles that were Right. you know, good ideas. And so I think it's a combination of, of like almost anything of getting lucky, but also putting in a lot of work behind the scenes. I mean, once you're, you're published at the times and slate, et cetera, then you have a reputation and it's easier then to move forward. Or is that, not it true? is, no, it is. Um, it's again, that's sort of a positive feedback cycle. Yeah. And so getting that kickstarted is the, is the hardest part, but yeah. I would be lying if I would say it doesn't help to have those sure. uh, published articles from time to time. I had a journalist here this week, uh, David Tuller. He's from uh, Berkeley and he does some, he does science writing as well. And he published an op-ed at the times. It was his first uh, couple of weeks ago. And he said, then they called him afterwards and he said, if you have anything else, please send it. Mm -hmm. Once you get in, then you have an in, mm -hmm. right? And that really yeah. helps a lot. Yeah. That's amazing. Now, should, we should point out that you have a website, timrecorth.com. And if you go to that website slash writing, you have examples of uh, some of the writing that, that uh, you've done at the Times, Slate, Newsweek, uh, Foreign Policy, Nautilus, great bunch of articles all over, right? Not mm -hmm. just uh, biology. Uh, Scientific American, too. Great. One has a picture of uh, the fish. It one does, brainy yes. Fish. Yep. One brainy fish. So that's the electric fish. Yeah, what I wrote a, that one in graduate school. What an interesting right. little, what is that at the very tip? Coming that's the, it's actually the chin, but <laughs> it, it looks like a nose. Yeah. Nice. Um so let's, what is, uh, this is, I just heard you say this also, I'm pronouncing it new right, but you're saying it nor right, nor right, right? Which is the way you had meant, right? Uh, some people say new right, some people say nor right. I will say I did not come up with the name. It's uh, <laughs> sort of, I, I think when it was first invented, it was a pun on developmental neuroscience, which yeah. is a joke that approximately four people in the universe <laughs> would get. Yeah. Uh, but a nor right is a developing yeah. neural process. And so. Where did I just see another website that had a. Unlike that. Anyway, uh, what is Neurite? So, Neurite is a collective of scientists and non scientists mm -hmm. that all share the goal of learning to communicate science accurately and in, in an engaging manner. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it started at Columbia, I guess it's been about eight years. Mm -hmm. um, and the core of it is the writer's workshop uh, where people bring in work that they're, um, that's in progress. So a scientist might be writing a book for a general audience and she would bring in a book chapter or a journalist might be working on a feature article and he would bring in a draft of that article mm -hmm. and we all provide feedback on it, etc. There's nothing particularly novel about the writer's workshop. They've been doing it since the thirties, um, in the, the Iowa creative writing, mm -hmm. uh, program. But I think what is interesting and new about Neurite is that it's usually not people with such distinct worldviews uh, or uh, skill sets, rather, mm -hmm. and worldviews in the room. And so I think that the sort of mutual ignorance of each other's fields is really what is the engine of those groups. Um, and they've since proliferated. There's a few here at Columbia now, one at NYU, and then maybe seven or eight either starting or uh, established around the country, uh, one in London and then mm -hmm. maybe one in uh, Australia. So. Yeah, I looked at the list of people and I recognized lots of names mm -hmm. from the New York City yeah. you know, science scene. It's, it doesn't sound like much, but it's been a surprisingly um, effective and engaging way to, I think, up the level of communication skills and scientists and up the level of science comprehension uh, in writers, journalists, artists, and filmmakers who are interested. So I want to ask you, you have uh, radio producers and filmmakers. So mm -hmm. do they also have their own workshops? Um, no. So the group, you Just know, includes, would, it includes them. So we've done, uh, we've worked on radio lab pieces. We've worked on documentaries, things like that before they come out. Um, so if I wanted to, uh, so, so say I'm writing a radio script mm -hmm. and I wanted to run it by the group. Could I join and do that with that? Yeah. I mean, the way that the group works is we usually have a, 
you know, we have kind of a core membership. So mm -hmm. um, uh, we ask people to, you know, regularly attend the meetings to provide feedback on others' work and then, you know, submit something um, periodically. We do occasionally do guest sessions, but yeah, of course, for people that have a group in their area, um, they can get in touch with me or the leaders in their area and talk about joining. So it's okay. sort of a neurite network. Yeah, it's more. <laughs> it's it's a network. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna. I'll get in touch with you. See if I can mm -hmm. get in because I'd love to participate. Mm -hmm. I have a lot to learn. I see Stuart Firestein is here. Is he's one of the contacts, right? Yeah. So Stuart, um, it, it was actually founded uh, by Stuart. It was founded yeah. right before I I got uh, to Columbia, cool. and uh, Stuart and uh, Carl Schoonover and Clay Lacefield, who were graduate students at the time, uh, founded it. He's been on Twiv twice. Carl has Stuart. Oh, Stuart. Yeah. yeah. His, his two books, right? Uh, yeah. Failure and Ignorance. Ignorance, yeah. For each one, he, he came on and talked about it, and yeah. <clears throat> they were really good. Yeah, I, I have an idea for a, a new show, and it needs to be scripted. Mm -hmm. so that would be something that would be... And Jonathan, I, I ran it by John, he said, you need to have a really good script. <laughs> yeah. And so I said, yeah. all right. <laughs> this sounds like a perfect way to... Yeah, so we, yeah, we've definitely done scripts for yeah, cool. various things. Let's talk about... Um, Scientists stop thinking explaining science will fix things. It won't. Now, what, what what's the core of this uh, issue, Tim? Um, now, this is this is an article you wrote for Slate, right? Slate, That's yeah. correct. April nineteenth, twenty seventeen. By the way, I love the image that goes along with this. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I had no hand in that, but it is pretty funny. That's very good. Yeah, very good. It's a, a picture of who? Do you know who that is? Doesn't say no. Uh, but it, it, it's a. Uh, you know, wizened scientist in a lab coat in front of the typical chalkboard full of diagrams and equations and stuff. And he's got a, he's got a speech balloon coming out of his mouth that looks like it's all chromosomes or something, or it's like just all gibberish, yeah. just yeah. gibberish. <laughs> so everything is gibberish. If they could have made the Charlie Brown parent noises come <laughs> yes. out of his mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, right. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. It, it looks a lot to me like Charles Darwin, but Modern I don't day. see right. Charles yeah. Darwin with having glasses on in his no. images. No. So, yeah. But I, in some ways, I feel like the image, when I reflect upon it, is actually a little bit not the point. And mm -hmm. part of the point is that the issue isn't that it's gibberish for a lot of people, for many, right. many issues. They do understand the basic, um, you know, science and the opinions of scientists and still do not have an opinion that is aligned with what the science community's opinion would be. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's, it's not even quite the right cartoon. Yeah. I think you're thinking about it. It's true. Yeah. It's not. I mean, so how did you come about doing this? I mean, was it the science March? Was it the current administration that kind of triggered it? Yeah. I mean, I think that it's a moment, the science March. So that was on the eve of the science March or it was a few days before it was to be held. And I think since the, election, there has been a surge of interest in scientists, open interest in mm -hmm. becoming politically active or more engaged with the public in many different ways. And I spoke with people at Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, AAAS, um, and then a couple of science communication organizations, Compass and uh, Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science, and they all reported uh, upticks in enrollment and uh, since the since the election, and so this was already growing. I mean, I think that workshops for scientists learning to communicate had have been growing for the past ten years. So it's not really a new phenomenon, but I think it got turbocharged a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and given that a lot of scientists are interested in moving in this direction, I felt like writing the article because it's important to understand that this is a skill and to identify what your goals are and how to do it. And my um, experience with a lot of scientists is that they have an implicit assumption that if only people understood things better, and I do, so I'm the person to explain them, then everything will mm -hmm. kind of work out. And they might not express that explicitly, but it's sort of the operating assumption mm -hmm. um, under the hood. And I don't think that's a good model uh, if you're trying to achieve uh, uh, changing minds. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have other goals, it might be fine. 
Yeah. And this, by the way, this is a problem not just with science and scientists, but um, I at least have seen this with people who have whatever belief and who sincerely believe that the only reason other people don't agree with their perfectly obvious belief is that they must not understand. Yeah, I think it really so is. I think there's a mm-hmm. there's a fundamental human tendency to think, well, if somebody doesn't agree with me, it must be because they don't understand mm-hmm. what I understand. I think you're exactly right. And science is no exception. And mm-hmm. I think it's worth re- reflecting and explicitly stating that. So is this the deficit model? Yeah, that would be yeah loosely called the deficit model. So this says that people's, from your article, people's opinions differ from scientific consensus because they lack knowledge. Right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. so scientists say, well, we'll give you this knowledge and fix everything. Right. right. And, you know, I'm not making this up out of thin air. This, <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. Are, there is, believe it or not, a field called the science of science communication. Sure. Right. And there's a, a number of researchers who have, you know, either taken surveys or done um, experiments to show that the deficit model does not really apply. And they've also done research that shows that scientists basically think that it does. Hmm. Right, so. which is that—that that is a way in which science is exceptional. Because if you're a scientist talking to another scientist, especially in your field, and they believe that protein A does such and such, and you have shown that protein A does something entirely different, um, the way to persuade them is to show them your data. Right, and but even as a scientist, I think we would probably all have experiences where people entrench themselves and yes. look at the same data and and right. see it in two different ways. There was a famous experiment, I think, in the 1950s, where they showed Harvard and Yale students um, uh, video clips of a referee call on like a football game or something, and it was the um, they didn't tell them what the call was, but of course, all of the Yale students thought it was in favor of the Yale team and all of the Harvard (laughs) students thought it was in favor of the Harvard team. And it just goes to show that you can look at the exact same piece Mm -hmm. of information and come to two entirely different conclusions. Um, And I think people are slow to to change their minds. And when it comes to political beliefs, it's more often, I would say, like a conversion Mm -hmm. and less like a sort of rational decision. Now, related to this is what you call the backfire effect. What's that? So the backfire effect, and you know, like many things in psychology, has come into question itself recently. <laughs> uh, the exact um, <laughs> under which conditions it's it's true. Um, but the original experiments were when you show someone various kinds of evidence uh, that challenges their belief, they tend to entrench themselves further in the belief. So they become less likely to change their mind than um, if you hadn't done that at all. Mm. And so, in other words, presenting evidence can backfire. And so that's, um, that's uh, what that, those studies shows. But uh, it's turned out to be, I think, a little more complicated than that. But in some mm. cases, I think that does hold. Now, now you, you, you write here that if scientists simply want to explain their science or disseminate their research, none of this matters, right? But if you want to change minds, then you have to learn some communication, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So, um, so w- w- when scientists want to communicate, do they think about changing minds or are they just thinking that putting the information out there is enough? Well, it's and again, there have been some studies on this that are uh, trying to... F- assess what a scientist's goals are. Like Mm. when they sign up for these workshops, why are they signing up? When they um, uh, write something, why are they writing it? And the research here is pretty young, uh, but it seems to point that there's, it's correcting misinformation. It's, it's, they, they they all tend to have a a sort of uh, Mm. uh, correcting of information and like setting the record straight and getting more people to support science. So it's in, to get their opinions aligned with the consensus. So I think for a lot of scientists, not all, but I think for a lot of scientists, the goal tacitly or when asked is to, at some point, change minds. Mm. So do you think that if a scientist wants to do any of this, that they would be a good thing for them to take a workshop of some kind and, and learn the right technique and so forth? I mean, I think that any scientist should take a careful look at what their goals are mm-hmm. um, before simply 
sort of taking to Twitter in exasperation. Mm. Their communication <laughs> might be the way to achieve what you want, but another way might actually just be, you know, uh, political activism or working with somewhere like the Union for Concerned Scientists where you can talk to local policymakers, uh, find pressure points, work on a watchdog team, uh, those sorts of things that are not so much communicating with the public, but they are communicating with non-scientists. So I think some of these skills apply, but it's a slightly different set of skills. So that's one option. Mm -hmm. If someone is interested in communicating, again, I think ident identifying their goals and learning what it is they want to achieve and then adapting their communication style and learning those skills is the way, is the way to go. Mm. You, know, you also mentioned that p scientists should work with groups that they're familiar with already, right? Yeah. Um, there's, uh, you know, one of the ideas behind uh, any sort of, uh, you know, obviously human interaction is you want to feel like the person communicating with you is on your team or on mm -hmm. your side, or at least understands your perspective and gains and has some credibility in the communities that you care about. And so for scientists to work within a community that they belong to um, or are active in, you know, whether it's a, you know, a religious community, a local community, any, is going to be potentially a more effective way to reach people mm. uh, because you're already going to have that credibility. Whereas sort of the you know, expert from out of town who comes to talk to people doesn't quite have that. that you know, the, it, it, again, it could backfire. It could just be seen yeah. as, as someone telling people yeah. what to think and nobody likes to be told what to think, right. especially from a stranger. Well, and especially if it disagrees with what they already believe. Exactly. I've heard this a lot and I'm wondering if there's any evidence that this works or is it all just sort of empirical or sort of narrative comments that um, for instance someone said you know you just establish a friendship because you both love your dogs and then you have a relationship and eventually then you might have a chance to talk to them about science mm -hmm. um, do you know is there is there any evidence backing this up? And then I have a second comment after that, if you mm -hmm. want to answer first. Um, so again, I think these are, this is a growing field. If it's related specifically to science, um, there's a researcher, Dan Cahan, K-A-H-A-N, mm -hmm. you may have mm -hmm. heard of, uh, mm -hmm. Dominique Broussard. There, uh, there's a few people that have really done, and I know one of Dan's studies, I believe actually it was i think on hiv so it might have a, a virus uh <laughs> connection for you but it was when you communicated risks of hiv depending on what community background you were from it was more effective um with uh, yeah so people. the trusted intervention kind of thing yeah. yeah in fact there's a faculty member in my department who does that in africa yeah um, for HIV specifically. Yeah. So especially in communicating health risks, I think this is a, this sort of thing has been studied. I'm certainly not an expert in this area. Um, so it'd be worth a close look at the literature, but I, people have worked on this. There's, yeah. um, there's actually quite a lot of very, very well financed research that has definitely been done on this that has unfortunately not been published. Um, there's a whole sector called marketing that is dedicated <laughs> right. to getting people to change their behaviors and their beliefs. And um, unfortunately, this is generally done for proprietary ends. And so we don't get the data. And I'm not sure that it's all even done in, in very rigorous ways, but it's done in a context in which the results are very carefully measured. Um so I, uh, Kathy's asking if there's published work on this. And as you say, there, there's some, um, but I think it's worth acknowledging that there's, uh, there has certainly been a lot more research done on this that nobody's publishing. That is true. And I would imagine the level of data is extraordinary in the past five years uh, yes. because of the, the growth of social media and online data tracking. Yeah. I mean, I, I know the pharma industry has troves of information on what, what yeah. causes somebody to ask their doctor about whatever. Um, and what causes a doctor to prescribe something. And what causes a doctor to prescribe something. So uh, that, is, that is out there and that is getting at the same type of a problem. Um, I've, so I'll, I'll turn it back to Kathy. <laughs> yeah. So 
Um, a couple of weeks before the March for Science, uh, there was a panel discussion here, and um, one of the people said, uh, well, anyway, I, I understand this approach, and it, it does resonate that if you have an, a relation, relationship with someone, then you're going to have more credibility and, and so forth. But it just seems frustratingly slow. And this mm-hmm. person asked this audience here at the U of M, you know, to raise your hand if you regularly have conversations with people who didn't go to college. And mm-hmm. it was vanishingly few hands mm-hmm. went up. And, and you know, I thinking about it, I can think of two people in my realm that I have that kind of relationship with that where I've maybe had an effect. But it's it just doesn't seem that satisfying that, uh, you know, I've affected two people. (laughs) Yeah. So I don't know if there's a good answer for that. I mean, I think that in some ways that is the frustration of almost any average citizen's political power (laughs) is that Mm -hmm. there can be very little, um, that a single person can do. Um, it's also hard because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a careful balancing act for the, you know, the, quote unquote institution of science, because with something like climate change, there's an active disinformation campaign that is, that is quite coordinated and well-funded. Um, and is it science's job to come up with an opposing information campaign that uses techniques from marketing and this and that? Um, I think that's a, I mean, that's a debate within the community, Mm. but it's, it's it's hard to get like sort of wholesale endorse that science like as an institution should start to adopt these tactics because I think in the long term there there is a danger of um, it you know not in terms of the backfire effect but backfiring in terms of the politicization of science and the sort of long term potential loss of of authority and credibility and I think those do have to be balanced. So let's 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 take the example of climate change. Mm-hmm. Uh, if uh, if you want to, this is actually you personally, but also you in the more global sense, want to try and change people's minds about climate change, uh, help them see the truth, knowing how entrenched this has become and how opinionated it's become. What what approaches? do you think would work? What should, what should we do? Well, I mean, I think of course, again, there's a lot of debate about what does and doesn't work, but framing, uh, framing climate change in terms of local and immediate, um, effects on a person or their community is, it's challenging with climate change, but that's, that can be useful. So for example, if you're talking to a crowd of college kids, you might emphasize that there will be jobs in the green sector, you know, for them after college, if they, or if you're talking to a coastal place, you could talk about, you know, the danger that, uh, Mm -hmm. rising sea levels will, uh, due to homes and if even more, um, real estate prices, you could, talk about it as a matter of, of national security, although that's a little, a little more distant. So I think that there are ways to, to do that and also to get across that it, it really is happening now and things like uh, Sandy and it's hard to link those things directly. Of course, we all know the caveats, but that those things are going to increase on a regular basis. People do understand statistics and probability. And I think they do understand that just because you maybe can't exactly link one storm to climate change, that that if they increase in frequency, that that would be um, uh, bad for their community. There's, you know, there's those famous experiments in psychology where you can ask someone, would you rather have, you know, $200 now or $400 in a year? And everybody says $200 now. (laughs) Um, Those might not be the exact numbers, but the principle holds. Uh, We have a really hard time as a species thinking about stuff that's uh, far off in the future. And that's hard for climate change. And we're horrible at statistics. We're we're bad at it, but at the same time, if you talk to people about sports and the, they can, yes, they're yeah. pretty good with statistics. So I have a hard time saying that. Like we're, I think people are capable of understanding statistics at a level that is uh, sophisticated enough to understand climate change. 
Right. So, we just we have we have a tendency to overemphasize risks that are dramatic and immediate, and underemphasize risks that are at least conceptually less dramatic and longer term. Yeah, and I think that you know one of the debates also in uh, among scientists is how to communicate uncertainty, and there is uncertainty in science and medicine. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that it can be exploited, and it is being of exploited course. right now by you know people like Lamar Smith and other uh, you know Republicans in Congress saying that it's no longer they're not denying climate change they're just saying oh well there's scientific uncertainty they're exaggerating the uncertainty, and so it is dangerous. But at the same time, people aren't stupid. They if you tell them that things are a hundred percent certain that sets off alarm bells. They're like, I don't know about that. Really? Is it a hundred percent certain? So interestingly, and I think people are starting to warm up to this idea, communicating uncertainty can be a way to gain credibility. You know, you can, you can say, Hey, look, you know, there is a little bit of uncertainty here, but let's put it this way. If 97 out of a hundred doctors told you to exercise 20 minutes a day and you're probably not going to die, you know, of (laughs) course nobody does that, but you could, you could you can put it in terms I think that put the uncertainty in its proper place, but still acknowledge that you know you're not a godlike figure that knows the future. Right. One of the other so there there are other uh, issues besides climate change where there's a big anti-science, uh, well-funded faction, mm-hmm. as you said. There's anti-vaccines, anti-GMOs. So we one of the things we do when we're uh, talking about vectors for viral diseases, mosquitoes. The mosquito range is increasing because mm-hmm. of increasing climate. That's a very yeah. clear thing, and that's going to affect you because the eighties aegypti will move north from Florida, and you know people can understand that. And recently, in the last few episodes of TWIV, we've been taking your original uh, your article that we we're talking about that we discussed on the uh, uh, TWIV before the science march. And trying to see how we would use emotional stories, which is one thing you suggest, mm-hmm. to convince people to vaccinate their kids. And so Alan Dove told the story of his kid, and we've had a, a listener mm-hmm. chime in and write in and tell stories. So I think that that's a good way as well. Mm-hmm. How, what's, how has it affected you and your children? And, and for people hearing stories from other people, I think helps as well, right? I, I do. I think that does help. I did want to talk about something else when you mentioned... Um, Dan Kahan, it reminded me, and, and also when we were talking earlier about how reading something in a different field can be really challenging. Mm-hmm. He had a recent paper in Advances in Political Psychology, which I made it all the way through, but mm-hmm. it was because the title is Science Curiosity and in Political Information Processing. Mm-hmm. And he and co-authors worked out a way to actually measure scientific curiosity taking into account both self-reporting and some other objective measures. And what they came to the conclusion, they came to the conclusion that science science curiosity promotes open-mindedness that allows them to engage information that's contrary to their political predispositions. Mm. And I just found that encouraging and optimistic. And at the end of the article, they do say, you know, this is early days and a lot more studies have to be done. But uh, the idea would be if we could figure out a way to promote scientific curiosity, Mm -hmm. uh, that would be fabulous. But if people knew how to do it, they'd have done it already. He's quoting one line right out Mm -hmm. of the paper. Um, but, But it does make the point that science communicators should scrupulously avoid putting people in the position of having to choose between using their reason to be who they are and using it to know what is known by science mm-hmm. because they're going to choose being who they are every time mm-hmm. pretty right. much was the, was the gist of it. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. yeah. So. So, so I've been looking at the, you pasted this graph into the uh, show notes, Kathy, and mm-hmm. I've been staring at this thing mm-hmm. since before the podcast started because <laughs> there's this one really disturbing graph that I've been aware of. On the left-hand side, where yes, uh, it basically uh, the bottom line is that it uh, really emphasizes uh, the tendency for people who identify themselves as conservative Republicans to deny climate change, uh, and those who identify themselves as liberal Democrats to accept uh, that is the human factor in in climate change. And, 
I don't understand this. I mean, I understand how there can be sort of an, a, an economic uh, reason for denying climate change. Because if you accept the notion that humans are involved in climate change and you have to do things to change it, it's going to impact businesses Okay, like the fossil fuel industry and that kind of stuff. And so you're going to come up with with objections to that. But the everyday run of the mill person on the street who identifies themselves as a conservative doesn't necessarily have those motivations in mind. Mm -hmm. Is this a sort of a group think thing? Like I'm conservative. I identify with this conservative group. Therefore, this is my opinion. Of this? this is how, this how is this the work? this is the bifurcation that Roger Ailes gave us as his legacy, as the founder of Fox News. Um, the the culture war. The uh, you know, are you a real American or are you one of those elitist liberals in the cities? Yeah. And and that dichotomy, I think, has been a yeah. huge driver of this, and it's why. When people are conservative Republicans and they learn more science facts, they will become more and more entrenched in their positions mm. because Fox News told them that this is what their identity is. I mean, it's not entirely that simple, but this is this is how people are constructing their identities, and there is an industry dedicated to helping them do that. Yeah. So it seems to me, if that's the case, it seems to me that one of the fundamental things that one wants to do in order to communicate science is to uh, counter this effect is to help people to think outside that particular box yes uh, uh, and i don't know how to do that I, i've been thinking about this uh well a lot but in particular since the science march and you know i was motivated after the science march i want to go into my uh, grandchildren's schools and, and teach critical thinking you know, mm -hmm. to me, it's sure. K, K through 12 learning how to think for yourself is 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 where this needs to be done. But I, I don't know how to do that. It's I, I actually had a little experience with that when I was in New York City um, in and shortly after graduate school. Um, I was coaching high school debate teams in schools. I forget what the designation was, but it was schools where uh, more than a certain percentage of the kids were from households below poverty line. Um mm -hmm which is another way of saying failing inner city schools. Um, so these are these were poor kids in New York, in the New York area. And we um, I was it was part of a nonprofit organization that formed debate teams at these schools and had them compete in high school debate at the national level. Um, that, to me, is an outstanding way to teach critical thinking skills mm -hmm. because you're taking teenagers who desperately want to belong and putting them in a situation where the way to win is to prevail in an argument which you do by thinking critically about facts. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Uh, so that can be very effective. And if you are lucky enough to get a hold of an organization <laughs> like that in your area, um, I would strongly recommend getting involved. I'd be curious to see if if something like that persists, you know, mm -hmm. those skills persist or if it requires such a wholesale culture change. And I, I do worry that it's a bit of a a bit of a fantasy um, to think that, again, it's like almost another version of like, if only people knew how to think right, then everything would be okay. And, um, it, which is just like one step removed from if they only, if they had the facts. Right, right. I and think it's an important step. Though. It is, it is. I'm not, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you, but I worry, like, the, I think in Kahan's paper, he points out, I don't know if it's that paper, but in one of them, he points out, it is in some sense logical to uh, deny climate change if all of the people around you do. If, yes. if, if that requires the people that you work with getting your promotion, doing that. Imagine, you know, if you didn't believe in climate change or vaccines, it would be harder around the people probably that you mm -hmm. associate with. Um, and so in some sense, it's logical for you to adopt those views because it's socially better for you. And so I think that when we say what's a logical or not logical decision, it's important to understand that there's many ways to think about that. Yes. One thing I'm that sitting. I... Go, go ahead. ahead, Kathy. No, uh, 
I found in the comments to Tim's Slate post, I didn't go very far down, but um, there's oh, a... Oh, God, don't read the comments on a science journalism. No, 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 <laughs> no. This is good. This is um, by a, a professor at uh, University of Colorado who tells about and provides links to his course materials where in uh, basic science classes, they use pseudoscience to teach the nature of science. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, that's another way that if there's listeners out there that are teaching introductory biology courses, you might be able to uh, put this in as part of your curriculum and, mm -hmm. and take a look at these links. And I just emailed it to you guys. That's great. Yeah, I think there was an interesting... I think that's a great idea because also uh, people have an, an a lot of people have an inherent tendency to want to sort of see through a myth or see through something. Mm -hmm. And there was this interesting um, experiment where people were trying to get teenagers to eat more healthy, and they presented junk food as a sort of trickster corporation trying to swindle them and mm -hmm. like. Y mm -hmm. you know, trick them into doing something that was bad for them for their gain. And the real way to screw the system was not to buy into that mm -hmm. and eat carrots. And so <laughs> it really, it tapped into, I think, a natural sort of rebellion impulse in teenagers. And it apparently was fairly effective on a small scale. And so I think that for in a larger, in the larger picture, people do like to know about pseudoscience, about things that have been debunked, because it feels good to like, you know, feel like you've seen through something. And that right. nutrition example has the um, has the added benefit of kind of being based on a true story. Mm -hmm. mm. Right there, there is an industry that's trying to sell. It you is, that. yeah. And you know, climate change. It's you know, it's a very there's a very clear economic benefit for a group of people to not having climate change be accepted. I mean, it's, you know, there is a clear link there. Things like vaccines and and other things can be more complicated, but I don't know if it's actually that complicated with climate change. Right. And I think maybe, uh, maybe I'm being optimistic here, but um, the, there could be just the idea of appealing to people's sense of cynicism. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, okay. So you're saying that there's this conspiracy of scientists telling us that the, that we're causing climate change. Um, what's their motivation? Yeah. And, and just approach it that way versus what would the motivation be for somebody to try to cover that up? Yeah. And you can imagine that there are trillions of dollars on the line that would provide exactly that motivation. Yeah, and I think that people are deeply skeptical of pharmaceutical companies mm -hmm. sure. for that reason. They're they're and so I, I think that is absolutely possible. I just want to fill in the gap. The name of the faculty member at University of Colorado is Doug Duncan. He's in astrophysical and planetary sciences. And if you go to his resources page, he's got his curriculum linked right there. Great. Ah, cool. Thank you. It's also in the comments of Tim's slate. Right post but either way you can find it so kathy i was thinking before when you said you know raise your hand if you've if you've talked to someone how is it if what? you talk it regularly have conversations with right. people who didn't go to college so i think here on twiv we do i think, mm -hmm. yes. I think so we have tens of thousands of people listening and i think a lot of them uh, have not gone to college and we know because they write to us and they tell us what they're doing and many of them say you know, I I've, I listened to your podcast, I got inspired, and I went back to college. So, mm -hmm. you know, that wasn't our goal in, initially. I mean, let me just tell you what we're doing here, and our original idea was to use conversations as a way of bringing a cool science to someone who wants to learn about mm -hmm. it, right? And the people who listen are the people who seek out the information. We're not trying to find people and convince them mm -hmm. of something else, although... You know, we do talk about vaccines a lot, and I think some people have written that they appreciate having information that they can use to talk to their mm -hmm. friends and uh, convince them to be vaccinated. But the idea is, I think, as you say in your article, we want to perpetuate uh, this cool field, viruses, bacteria, um, whatever, uh, in a conversational way, not a lecture. Because mm -hmm. I personally mm -hmm. think lectures are the worst way <laughs> to teach mm -hmm. you. I think when you sit and have a conversation in front of a class and you engage them, that's a better way to learn. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that was our approach originally, and we thought anyone who's interested in science, and we attract a remarkably broad range 
of individuals from people in high school all the way up to professionals mm-hmm. in all sorts of fields, which is really interesting to me that, and I think it's because in part the field, um, the fields that we talk about are interesting mm-hmm. and they, they touch people's lives in a very direct way that, you know, there are outbreaks of diseases mm-hmm. and so forth. Uh, and people come and they want to learn. So, I mean, in the, in your scheme of, of communication, does that, does that make sense what we're doing or are we wasting our time? Do you think? No, I mean, it, it, it does. It's, um, again, some of the research, you know, having a, a dialogue or, mm-hmm. or having a conversation either directly with a person or in a way that really looks at both sides of an issue, I think can be, um, be very useful because it, it, it validates, um, a, a, a person's viewpoint instead of simply, again, just lecturing at them. Yeah. I think we so, do mm-hmm. try and present both viewpoints when there are, and we try and point out the faults of studies. And we also bring our own personalities into the mix. Mm-hmm. They say, Hey folks, this is what is science. We're mm-hmm. concerned about the weather and, the, and all that. Yeah. People seem to really like that part mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> as well. So you keep, get it as, as, um, David Quammen said, talk about the people doing the science. If you yeah. want to teach people doing science, and that's what we do. We, 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 mm-hmm. we pitch it from our personal perspective, not from a lecturer up at the front of the room who's being very formal and so forth. I mm-hmm. mean, I think that's why, in part, it works. Anyway. Yeah. So. Scientists are humans, too. Yeah, we are. Out. <laughs> so, Tim, I'm interested um, to hear something about your goals. Where's all this going? Uh, are there books in the works? What are you gonna do? Uh, yeah, there will be some books in the works, um, some longer. I'm I'm really focusing on longer um, articles and projects at the moment that investigate science more broadly in society mm-hmm. and how it how it affects it. I, I had recently just uh, written a piece for the New York Times on a court in San Francisco that is looking at developmental neuroscience and psychology to sort of experiment with a new approach to 18, 19, 20, and 21-year-olds in the justice system. Yes, uh, I read that. It's very nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, that's that's a... In, in the New York Times article, which was shorter, you get the idea, and it's an important point that there's potentially this developmental phase after 18 that kind of we intuitively seems reasonable, but is surprisingly understudied. Uh, but there's deeper questions about the relationship between science, uh, crime, and youth. Uh, psychology was used to justify the juvenile system after the idea of adolescence was brought into play in the about 120 years ago. And as we sort of coalesced around this age of 18, science sort of split up that way too. Mm. And that's a completely meaningless distinction really, from biology's perspective, and yet it's kind of how fields get structured. And so it's a feedback. You know, science isn't sort of divorced from the world that we live in. It's a part of it. And investigating the the kind of two-way street between science and the rest of the world is, I think, the direction that I'm heading in. Hmm. Very interesting. So when when you write for these various outlets, you know, New York Times slated, is it a different audience that you're writing to? I can imagine the Times audience is very unique, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you write a grant for, uh, you know, a scientist, you're kind of writing for two people at once, right? You're writing for the general person that can, or, 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 or a paper, say, let's just say a paper. You're writing for the general scientist that could maybe understand it, that's close to mm-hmm. the field, but it's not exactly his or her field. And, but you also need to write so it's absolutely correct for the person who knows your work precise like very well and so for a place like the the new york times or anywhere really i try to write for multiple audiences at once you know i want it to be accessible Mm -hmm. and for people to understand and for there to be a story or an idea that can get people through the piece but i also want to have the details as much detail as i can get in there so the people that are interested uh who know more about it don't feel that it's been shortchanged um And the way that I do that from a writing perspective is just to kind of signpost that like, this is the part where all the details are going to come (laughs) and you can skim over it if you don't care. And I think you can learn tricks to do that with writing. Um, And we all do it. If you notice yourself, you're reading that article about macroeconomics and you're just kind of like, all right, I'm not going to go into that stuff this time around, but you can get through the article. And so I, uh, that's what I aim for. 
Mm. So when uh, one of the things I used to tell my students about either speaking or writing is that a large part, uh, now I'm making this up from my own experience, I'm interested in your perspective, a large part of what you do in either speaking or writing is tell the audience what you're doing in your in your speech or your or your or your piece like okay as you said uh you know his this is all the details so you can skip over this if you want okay mm-hmm. so this is where we are in this piece this is what i'm going to do now oh mm-hmm. i did that now i'm going to do this mm-hmm. so they know where you are yeah i think that can be effective for certain kinds of uh speaking or writing uh I think there are artful ways to do it too. And Mm -hmm. especially when you're competing with maintaining a narrative or attention or suspense or something like that, it's probably not a good move. Mm -hmm. Uh, But for some articles, I think that's a great way to do it. I wonder if people do that with TWIV, uh, Rich. (laughs) You know, we get to the paper and they fast forward. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Because there is other stuff and maybe some people... Well, that's why it's important for us uh, to, to, to take this advice that was given us to start off by... Uh, summarizing a paper and end by summarizing a paper. Why it's important, right. yeah. what we're interested in. Yeah, a few people mm-hmm. said that we get lost. We'd like to hear at the end a summary why it's mm-hmm. why you're excited about it. Yeah. So we started doing that. We, we're really lucky. We have a lot of listener engagement. We get mm-hmm. dozens and dozens of emails every week, and we try and read most of them on yeah. the show. And people tell us, well, we want this. We try and respond as far as we can do it, you know. Um, uh, it, it's interesting that at the end of your article you say, I'm guilty of the deficit model because I'm telling scientists what they might not know. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what 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 do you do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh you know, that was one of the sort of central contradictions of that <laughs> article. And on the one hand, I you know, I want to believe that scientists who have spent so much time in training respecting data might be the small subset of humans who could actually listen to this argument in that way. But that also might be a fantasy too, because scientists are scientists. I think the real goal here was to get scientists to just examine their assumptions about why they want to do this. And maybe they don't buy what I'm saying. Maybe they, they don't, they don't care or don't agree, but I think they should think about it. Well, and I think scientists who, are or want to become involved in communicating science haven't really coalesced into a tribal identity. Yes. Um, so you're they're they're at a point where they're probably open to data about how that ought to be approached. That's a very good point because this you know nobody well I shouldn't say nobody but very few people argue about whether the earth goes around the sun or vice versa right but that was a really huge deal several centuries ago yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and so there are some things where the deficit model is totally fine if you tell someone no actually this the earth revolves around the sun they're sort of like okay I'll like I'll update that in my brain it's it's a question of whether there's been a Roger Ailes to uh, create their identity around yeah. mistaken belief or a, yeah. or a uh, um, yeah or a Wakefield. Yeah, I just I think that uh, Daniel Engber also in Slate he's a he's a great science journalist and he wrote an article before the mm-hmm. March called the uh, March on Science March for Science is a trap, and mm-hmm. it's it's polemic but the idea is that when you take actions like that it's easy to get scientists sort of lumped in with a nebulous left. And I, you know, I didn't go to the March for science, but how many conservatives were there? Yeah, of course. Right. I didn't, I didn't take a poll. I don't know. I, I'm wondering, I just say I, my feeling is that it was largely liberal probably, and probably there's, that's complicated reasons for that. But in the current environment, there's any choice that you have politically or communication, wise as a scientist has an effect sure. and I think that just if more scientists are going to get politically active and engaging with the public they need to think they need to understand that their choices have consequences no matter what those choices are on the other hand if you're saying that science should be in its own separate special category which to some extent I agree it is a unique way of getting at trans subjective truth um, but if we are never going to get involved in any kind of political action, even when we have an anti-fact administration and party in control of the country, then what is the point of being in a special group? Yeah, I mean, I, think I mean, why, why keep science as a special entity if you're going to 
destroy the, the world's going to get destroyed independently anyway. Yeah, and I mean, I think a lot of that motivated Einstein, you know, to become politically yes. active yeah. so many years ago. Sure. Yeah, and yeah at, a, at a certain point, you have to say, okay, you know, we we do have to get up and do something here. We cannot just pretend that this does not affect us and that we are neutral arbiters of fact when being a neutral arbiter of fact has itself it is is itself a political act. Yeah, and that's I think one of the most insidious things about the current moment um, yes. politically. And I am not sure of the exact strategy, but I think that scientists and 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 leaders and you know uh, in the field should I think they should think about what messages they want to get across and what would be a good message and stance and strategy for science and scientists to take in this environment that is less likely to backfire. I I think just being more Mm -hmm. considered about it and thinking about it and maybe frankly doing some research on it um, to figure out what kind of uh, messaging and tools actually work. So back to your article, it was actually sent to us by a listener Mm -hmm. and it totally resonated with me. Mm-hmm. And that's why you're here. And we've been talking about it ever since because I want to make sure we're doing the right thing because mm-hmm. we we think we are. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's always good to have a another view of what you're doing and you can always learn something. So mm-hmm. I think we have had have a new perspective on uh, on what we're doing. And I think we're adjusting based on what you're telling us as well. Mm-hmm. So at least in us, you know, there's so scientists are a wide and, and broad bunch, but, you know, there's always there there's so many stories of one scientist who didn't believe what everyone else yeah. felt and then that drove the field and it was right and so i love that kind of stuff and yeah. it just shows that they can be different you know? mm-hmm. <laughs> kathy i know you're about to say something well i just wanted to go back to the figure that i had pasted in that uh, concerned rich yeah and it's actually a two-part graph one graph shows on the x-axis the what they call the ordinary science intelligence and that as ordinary science intelligence goes up, then the distance between the liberal Democrats and the conservative Republicans increases uh, with respect to their agreement on the effects of human activity on global warming. But if you use this science curiosity scale, then both groups, uh, their probability of agreement will go up. And that's what I find encouraging if these kinds of experiments and and concepts really pan out that if we can figure out a way to engage with people's science curiosity then that can help sort of the rising tide will lift both both boats mm-hmm. if put right. it that way and so you know maybe we do get to some of that kind of audience with twiv and or mm-hmm. with you know, the person who cuts my hair and the person in the place right next to her, you know, the two people that I can affect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that goes back to, I think, I think it was Alan's point of, of maybe there is something to the idea of changing how people think or engage with the world in a general way yeah. that, that could be effective. Yep. Tim, I've kept you longer than I said. Um, appreciate your coming by. Thanks um, for having me. If you ever do anything, if you write something and you'd like to talk about it on one of our shows, you're welcome. You're right here in New York. I'm happy yeah. to have you come. We do Great. virology, microbiology, parasitism, and evolution podcasts, and probably there are more coming as well. All right. Uh, and we, so, can fit, we can fit just about anything in somewhere. We can. Mm-hmm. Yes. So you're at Tim, uh, timrecourth.com. Are you mm-hmm. also on Twitter? Uh, yeah. Same handle. Same Tim. handle, mm-hmm. Tim Recourth. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you so much for having me, and it was a pleasure to meet all of you. Me too. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tim. All right. Good. Bye-bye. All right, we had some follow-up from last time. Two, uh, three follows up. Uh, the first comes from Marion from TWIV441 at one hour and 31 minutes. Quote, a virologist by inheritance. Is that on the Y chromosome? I guess so. End quote. Sexist. All right, so I said that. Uh, here's, here's what it was in reference to. John Udell was, he wrote, I was reading his email. A proposal, how about a father-son TWIV episode, would that be a first? And then I said, a virologist by inheritance, is that on the Y chromosome? I guess so. No, no intention of being sexist. 
We had just gotten through a whole episode talking about the Y chromosome and its effect on vir- on a virus. Yeah. And it was father son. So I was referring yes. to him, which as far as I know, that involves a Y chromosome. Yes. So I wasn't saying that all virologists have a Y chromosome. Absolutely not. So, you know, sometimes there's unintentional sexism. I agree, but I don't think that. So let me ask my arbiter of good taste, Kathy, what do you think? Um, I have to say it kind of went right by me. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and I might have been thinking about the Y chromosome as being the Udell chromosome at the time. I don't know. Yeah, um, I, I was thinking of his son, you know, and that he was yeah. a virologist and so forth. So I didn't mean it to be sex. I, I don't actively try and do that for sure. So, all right, Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Paul writes, Dear Vincent and fellow Twivers, greetings from Oz. Another great podcast this week with your focus on a paper describing the role of the Y chromosome on influenza susceptibility. As always, it made my trip to and from work at the University of Queensland both pleasurable and informed. I wanted to pick up on a comment from another listener of a father and son virology connection and Vincent's throwaway comment that this genotype phenotype must be Y chromosome linked. Attached is irrefutable proof that the link must be anything other than the Y chromosome, perhaps epigenetic. And he sends a picture uh, of this, this is of my daughter and me in front of our respective posters at the Boston Positive Strand RNA virus meeting a few years ago. We were thrilled to be presenting side by side at the meeting. Lucy is currently a postdoc working in viral immunology in Seattle with Ed Clark. Her partner, Justin, is in Mike Gale's lab next door. If the phenotype is hereditary, it will be strong in our family. Both are also big fla- big fans of TWIV. Keep up the great work. Lots of fans in Australia, and I recommend the podcast to all my virology students. Weather in Brisbane is currently sunny and 23 degrees C, heading into what is our winter, or what we locally refer to as our not-so-hot season. <laughs> Uh, and I, I would just add, you know, <laughs> um, daughters and sons get more than an X or a Y chromosome from their parents. So this doesn't even have to be epigenetic. This could be a gene on any of the other chromosomes. But, uh, but this yes, is a I, great th- this is a great picture. And what a, a blast. Picture. What a blast to be at a meeting yeah, sharing cool. posters with your Next with to your, your child. Kid. That's, yeah. awesome. That's very awesome. Cool. Very cool. Love it. It pulls a professor at uh, the University of Queensland. And he's also head of school. I love that title. Head of school, yes. Oh, there's a P.S. Oh, yeah, P.S. Vincent, I mentioned, meant to mention, I now have my first ever polio paper, trivalent IPV delivery to follow soon. It's a very cool yeah. paper. It's about using these um, micro needle patches to oh. deliver. We, ah. maybe, maybe oh, we, we talked about that a long time ago. Yeah, yes, it was in a mouse model, that, that paper we did with flu, I think, Dick Compan's paper. Yeah. Very cool. cool. Yeah, and then we had a we had a, a I, I, when I think of this, I think about the other paper that we did um, uh, from Dick Moyer's lab, showing that oh, stimulating yeah. the skin with scarification yes. has great. an effect on how a vaccine takes. Right. Let's do this paper. Oh, right, we can do it. This this would be really good. Okay. Sure, you bet. Uh, Kathy. Okay, Ryan writes, <laughs> dear Twiv hosts. On TWIV 441, you guys went on a short tangent talking about the potential laptop ban on flights coming from Europe. You guys were mentioning how this is a problem as you can't get work done on flights and may have to resort to reading a paper book on the flight. Well, the problem is more than that. I'm a Singaporean working in the Middle East, and the laptop ban had hit us several months earlier. The ban here includes both laptops and tablets. The regulations state that these devices need to be checked into the baggage and won't be allowed on as hand carry. That's where the problem lies. We are scientists, and our electronic devices hold our extremely precious data. Insert Gollum meme here. (laughs) We can't run the risk of checking in our laptops when the airline can lose our bags or if our bags get handled roughly, resulting in damage to the device. I know this is a perfect ad placement opportunity for Drobo to sell their products, (laughs) but still, a lost or broken laptop can put a researcher back several days, if not weeks. The laptop ban and the horror stories of people traveling to the U.S. from the Middle East has scared us pretty bad over here. I've been accepted to present a poster for ASM at New Orleans next month, but the fears of losing my laptop or getting manhandled on flight or at border security has led me to decide against going to ASM. I've asked our American collaborators to present our data on my behalf. The saddest part of all, I only found that you guys will be recording a show at ASM after I decided not to go. I guess it's a little too late to change my mind, especially since my collaborators have accepted to present. 
On a side note, the IT store on campus now sells bubble wrap to wrap your laptops in if you're traveling to the U.S. I know I sound a little paranoid, but I've been hearing too many horror stories from the news or fellow colleagues traveling to and from the U.S. that I just won't want to risk it, even if it means not getting a chance to meet you guys. Sad face. Mm -mm. Best regards, Ryan. That's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we kind of tossed it off as, well, you could just play with your iPad on the flight, but... Um, for people, especially in fields where you've got huge amounts of data and you you need to transport that on your laptop. And, uh, yeah, how do you get that? I guess you could ship it separately, but then, yeah. Same risk. <laughs> well, you know at, at least you know, shipments are more trackable than airline luggage, frankly. But, uh, but yeah, that's a, that is a big, big problem. Do you know where Ryan's writing from? Yeah, Saudi Arabia. Because, I mean, he he talks not just to, there's a sentence here, he's not talking just about laptops in terms of traveling. Right. He says, uh, fears of losing my yes. laptop yes. or getting manhandled. Getting manhandled, like, yes. Or at border security. Yes. They're, really. He's in Jeddah. That's that's going on, too. Yes. It's really unfortunate. I'm sorry about that, Raihan. Yeah, it's too bad. Oh, we would have uh, yes. liked to meet you maybe another time. You know, even if you back up your data to the cloud, if you need to give a talk, right? And your laptop right. goes, what are you going to do? You know, it's a little hard. Or if you want to, as Alan said, if you want to show the data to a collaborator right there, it's, eh, it's a problem to get a new or, laptop and download it. For, for field researchers or people who are traveling to a collaborator's lab, you go and you get some data and you have it on your laptop and that's your only field researchers. That could be your only copy as you're taking it home. Yep. Um, <clears throat> yep. Now, pres- hopefully you'll send it by multiple means if you're doing that, but... Still, this is a, a major issue. Yeah, and how, how uh, what's the word? How serious is the threat, you know? It's not. It's, yeah. Is it as... But it's real right now for the Middle East. It, well, I mean, yeah. it is real that they can't bring their laptops or oh, their no, that part. No, yes, that part is, I'm just... He means, yeah. he means the threat that this is supposed to be a response to. Oh, um, I see what you're saying. Okay. I mean, yeah, supposedly there is some there is some ISIS interest in using laptops as a means to smuggle explosives onto uh, aircraft, and uh, you know that's always been a risk. And it's uh, I, I just don't think that this is an appropriate intervention. And isn't it a problem to put all these batteries in the luggage hold? Yeah, <laughs> if they're lithium batteries under FAA regulations, you actually can't do that. Yeah. Right. So, yes, another very good point. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, it's the same reason why we take our shoes off, right? Because someone burned their shoes or had a bomb or something in their shoes at so, one point. Because of a failed attempt to damage a, an airliner with a shoe bomb. Yeah. And so now we're going to take off our shoes because uh, that strategy failed, which doesn't make any sense at all. And remember then there was the underwear bomber the underwear that. Bomber. But yes. fortunately, they did not go there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> soon we'll be getting on naked but yeah. the, don't these high tech uh, scanners well you are essentially getting on naked when you go through the, the millimeter wave scanner yeah it's it the one a, where you put your hands up yeah you put your hands up and it sends a naked picture of you to somebody sitting in the basement and they they determine whether you're allowed on the plane now can't they tell if there's explosive in a laptop when you right this is the the thing is that apparently well, from what i've heard apparently uh there are technologies arising that uh uh, can evade the detection. Okay. okay I think right. that's, the, that's the concern. Got it. Right. Hey, Rich, can you take uh, the next one, please? Sure. Trudy writes, Hi, Twivers. In follow-up to your discussion about mouse work on TRIV 441, I would like to add that when I was working on RSV, we did all of our work in female mice, primarily because they were less aggressive than male mice. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Also, Mm -hmm. when I was at CDC, I recall hearing a very interesting talk by a staff scientist from Jackson Laboratories. Most notably, she discussed breeding methods and rules and the rules for mouse genetic nomenclature, which can be very confusing. Unfortunately, I don't remember her name, but I might suggest finding such a person as a guest for TWIV. (laughs) I found her talk very interesting, and it might answer some of your questions. Thanks, Trudy. Mm. I don't remember. What were her questions? (laughs) (laughs) Why? Why we? Do they name things in in the way that they do? Yeah, we just we had some mouse genetics questions for sure. Yeah. But um, 
I went to a mouse genetics meeting once, the International Mouse Genome Society, Genetic Society, I can't remember what it's titled, but all the abstracts that had been submitted had been gone through by one of these types of people in the society, and they had corrected all the nomenclature in everybody's abstract <laughs> and told them that so that they could go wow. back and you know look at what they had submitted and how it really should have been done. It's really quite technical and confusing, <laughs> but um, if you go to the JAX website and you're publishing on a mouse, if you get the name right from the JAX site, then you should be okay. That's the Jens Kuhn's of mouse genetic nomenclature, right? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, Jens, we don't mean to make fun of you. Yes, uh, we do. <laughs> he has a good sense of humor, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. He seems to. We have a he long did. email from Jens coming up. Maybe we'll get to it next week. We have one more today. This is from Bob, who writes, On TWIF441, the panel discusses consomic strains, details of genes on chromosome Y, etc., etc. I get at least the drift of the discussion. Thanks to having taken Dr. Rosalind Redfield's wonderful online Useful Genetics 1 and 2 courses. Every time I hear such a discussion, I again, in frustration, wonder whether there is a resource to learn more detail about the genome. Is there an encyclopedia genomica, as it were? For example, when panelist Kathy Spindler talks about some details of multi-copy genes on the Y chromosome, is she acquainted with such details as the result of her own research, papers she has read, or from such a resource? I know that this is not really a question specific to virology, but do any of the panelists know the answer? Thanks in advance for any help you can offer, Bob. What do you say, Kathy? Well, I don't know of any thing that he's specifically looking for, but maybe one of our listeners does and will write in and tell us about it, some kind of basic manual about all things genomics, genetics. To answer his question specifically, I got a hint from the paper that we are reading about multi-copy genes because first they looked at multi-copy genes uh, and then they concluded it wasn't multi-copy genes. So, I almost said this last week. So, duh, then they looked at single copy genes. <laughs> but um, anyway, so, and that had a reference to two papers. One was a review article uh, from the senior author's lab, so I looked at that. I also looked at Wikipedia for a basic reminder about the Y chromosome. My genetics textbooks, that I used to get them for free when I was in a genetics department, but now they're woefully out of date, so uh, I, I don't really have anything, so I would just go out and gather information from a lot of places, I guess, is the answer. So, so your Bob. genetics textbooks are hand-me-downs? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you, I mean, he says, are you acquainted with such details as the result of her own research? Yes, I would say. Papers you have read? Yes. Yeah. Right? For sure. I mean, these yeah. are things you've learned over the years as needed by reading papers and for your work, right. et cetera, et cetera. Right. Right. But this, he's looking for principles of mouth, mouse Got genetics it. or some, some kind of right. a sure. reference text like that. And they, that must exist, but. Might let us know. Yeah, or a, a more basic book, maybe a more a, a primer on, you know, genetics of, uh, well, organisms, complicated organisms. I'm sure they exist explaining it because you can find something in almost every area. I just don't have any. I'm, you know, looking at my shelf and you don't have any. Yeah, I have a book by Lee Silver called Mouse Genetics. Uh, it was uh, written around 1994. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it's good, but it's out of date. Well, it's probably complicated too, right? It is. Even it yeah, is complicated, yeah. and they've learned all this other stuff since then. Yeah, and I just uh, my my Google searches for this came up with Lee Silver's book. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Bob, I off I have trouble with it. Also, it's not easy, you know. Mammalian genetics complicated. That's why I work on viruses because they have yes. small genomes. The ones I work on, anyway, and I can understand what the genes are doing. My virus polio had about encoded about twelve proteins. Yeah, Kathy is very adventurous. She has a bigger, she works on a bigger virus. Although she's been, you know, dabbling more recently in smaller RNA viruses. So right. maybe she sees the light. <laughs> you know, and then, of course, there's Condit who's way out there. How many genes does Pox have? A couple hundred. A couple hundred. Couple. Oh, my gosh. Let's do some no picks. Let's picks of the week. Alan, what do you have for us today? I have uh, just a fun video. This is. Um, 
Let me scroll on down to it and bring it up. Give proper credit on this thing. Uh, the YouTube channel is called Warped Perception, and uh, I gather a big part of their gig is they they got a hold of one of these high speed 4K whoa, 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 high, high resolution slow motion um, <laughs> cameras, so it shoots at very high frame rates. And then you can slow, as a result of the high frame rate, you can slow this thing down to incredibly slow rates. And they show, um, uh, they show in this case, a model rocket engine mm. being ignited. And if you ever did this when, you know, if when you were a kid, or I remember in middle school, we had a little rocketry club, and um, you set everything up, you build your rocket, and then you, you go outside, and you set the whole thing up, and you push the... Uh, the igniter button and it goes and and just burns for a couple of seconds and the rocket goes oh. shooting up into the air and then a little poof and the parachute comes out. So you think about that very, very rapid <laughs> sequence and this is a video showing it in slow motion and I, I just found it really cool. <laughs> oh, this guy is so animated. Yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. flailing very his good. arms around. This is, the, yeah. this is a, a, a YouTube style to do this, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, these rockets, I remember, it was so quick. <laughs> yep. But this this bit where it's the, just the close-up of the engine burning. It's great. And you see the sequence of it, It's I think it's really cool. He's got it bolted down, right? Yes, so that you can actually watch it. It doesn't shoot off. And then the igniter melts and moves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so cool. I like the remark about the gorilla tape uh, holding up to the heat or something. Yes. Yeah. Instead, it was, he's using the specific gorilla tape brand of duct tape. Right. Uh, the funny thing is, he's got his dog outside, we're kind of walking around while he's right. filming all this. He's filming all this. <laughs> uh, so I can't, uh, I can't think about rocket engines without thinking about a college physics class that I had. So the way, the way rockets work is that you're throwing mass out the back of something. And for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right, so you throw mass out the back, and whatever it is you're throwing from moves forward as right. the reaction. When I do learned really, this, in, do you really believe that, uh, Rick? I, be I believe that. <laughs> and so, so there's uh, the uh, here's why I believe it. I had this uh, college physics course where, in the lecture describing that, at the end of the lecture, so this was a lecture hall that uh, had a you know, a demonstration table in the front and then some space and then the seats going up and back of that. And, and, uh, flanking the space on each side were exit doors mm -hmm. for the lecture hall. Okay. And so at the end of this lecture, the teacher, unfortunately, I can't remember his name. I can remember what he looked like, had what was kind of like a giant skateboard that he had made that he could sit on. Okay. And he had a bunch of sandbags, uh, by his feet on this thing. At the end of the lecture, he took all these sandbags and started throwing them off the back of the skateboard and it scooted him out the door. <laughs> oh, that's <All> right? great. <laughs> it was, you know, that's the kind of stuff you never remember. That's, I never forget. That's a rocket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. When I was a kid, I, I always wanted to shoot one of these off, but I was too young. I couldn't do it. So I, I would just look at them in catalogs and imagine. And then when I got older, I bought one and I was so disappointed because it was so quick. <laughs> Yeah. Couldn't see anything, like you said. Oh boy, uh, Rich, what do you have? Uh, this is a website called Sci Starter, and actually, I picked this up off of a listener email that I don't even know if we've done the email yet. I think so, and we sort of uh, uh, skipped by this. It was uh, embedded in his email, but this is a site that uh, aggregates uh, citizen science and makes it available. Citizen science being Oh, well, anything that uh, Joe Schmo wants to do in science. But a lot of it are sort of uh, crowdsourced science projects mm -hmm. where you need a lot of people to go out and do a couple of things and send their observations uh, in. Uh, and this uh, site is a place to either post your own citizen science project or to uh, uh, access others. And so there's ways to search for projects that uh, interest you or just uh, browse projects and see what they're about and see how you can pers participate. And I thought that was pretty interesting. So I'm going to ask a question at the risk of annoying someone, not not us, but someone listening. So do you think the people who do these citizen science projects are politically divided? 
do you think they're mostly liberal or mostly not, or s- some of both? You know, based on uh, the conversation we just okay, had. yeah. So the people who sign up for this, I don't know. Yeah, we don't know, but that's an interesting question because I was just thinking as you're talking. Wow, this would be a great way to get people engaged in science and have them do something and. Maybe that would help them with the whole thing. But then I'm thinking the people that come here may be all the ones in those graphs on the top that are. You know, well, you know what? I was looking at uh, Kathy's graph again yeah, yeah. here. And uh, the bit on the left, there's actually on the x-axis is graphed ordinary science intelligence mm-hmm. in percentile. And on the y-axis is the probability of agree. And it's actually interesting what, well, what happens is that as your scientific intelligence increases, uh, the polarization increases. But I was looking at this again, and on the left-hand side, down below the 25th percentile, where you don't know much science at all, there's not much difference between the conservative and the liberal. Yeah. So um, you got to get catch, them early catch, on. Yeah. Get them early on. I mean, the other thing I, which I was thinking of is, you know, the, the sampling for this. I mean. It could be a little messed up, right? Mm-hmm. It really is critical to get it right, and I'm not sure how they get these, these data, how what they ask them, and so yeah. forth. How do you, right. you know, do intelligence percentile? I think that's really hard. So I'm, I'm a little skeptical of the data themselves, right? Because it's so right. polarizing. Mm-hmm. Well, this is true of uh, social science is the hardest. Yeah, I understand type of science sure. because sure. you've got this uh, you got this problem, um, and there's also the causality and the and the kind of cross-contamination of um, how many variables are you really measuring here? Um, yeah, exactly. My son used to tell me that you should be skeptical of any science, in quotes, that needs to have the word science in the description of what it does. <laughs> Social science, political science, right? Yeah. As if On they the have to hand, tell you, yes, this is science. Right. On the other hand, um, you know, in their in their defense – Social sciences and and political science are addressing really really important questions, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and are doing so the best way they can. Right. Um, so this is this is just as good as the data are going to get, probably. The the conversation with my son was in the context of describing that he was in a computer science department. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's good. Kathy, what do you have? I picked channel two of uh, Smarter Every Day. So a while back, I picked his main channel. Mm. And this one is his more casual, less edited things that don't quite fit into the main channel. And this one is about Lifesaver Lightning. So it's all about how when you smash Wintergreen Lifesaver, uh, there's this luminescence. But of course, they put the uh, high-speed camera onto it and first they do it with a hammer and then they do it uh, with a pellet gun and the the high energy causes even more of this luminescence it's just really cool and it's funny when you see the hammer coming down it's got all these lifesavers still smushed on I the thought, head of the hammer yeah. <laughs> so i just thought it was cool and this is the, so when i had picked it before it was uh the one about Prince Rupert's drops yep. and there's now Prince Rupert's drop t-shirts available for pre-order. Uh, and I think by now maybe order, but anyway, uh, check it out. So the phenomenon is called tribal luminescence or tribal yes. luminescence. And I mm-hmm. looked it up on Wikipedia it says it's an optical phenomenon in which light is generated through the breaking of chemical bonds in a material when it is pulled apart, ripped, scratched, crushed, or rubbed. And then this is good. So it doesn't have to be a lifesaver. It could be anything, right? Right. Yeah. Because they don't explain it in the video. So I, I went to find out. It says, the phenomenon is not fully understood. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Okay. Not fully understood. That's science jargon for, uh, we don't get it. Right? <laughs> yep. Absolutely. There's a project for someone. This guy yep. is so popular. Yeah. The, the, bull, the Rupert Drop has 1.9 million views. You know, good for him. I, no, it's That's great. great. I want That's to do great. it too. I want to do it yeah. too. I mean, people should view something about a virus 1.9 million times. <laughs> All right, I'm working on it. Um, and the, let's see, what does this shirt look like? I didn't look at that. Prince Rupert drop T-shirts. 
Very nice. It's got that lovely drop on it in all different colors. Mm-hmm. Okay. Smarter every day. Nice. Is it my turn? You're done, Kathy, right? I'm done. All right. I have two picks. You know, the first is a podcast. I was just on a podcast very briefly. Uh, it just came out this week. It's it's by a show called Every Little Thing, and it is a podcast by the Gimlet Media Group, which makes lots of podcasts. They're based in Brooklyn, uh, and Every Little Thing is um, about explaining every little thing that's going on in the world. In a some can be science, it can be other things as well. They this this uh, group is very impressive. They make a lot of podcasts. They're highly funded. And the podcasts are all highly produced, which means they talk to a bunch of people and they splice them all together with music and sound effects. Not what we do here on TWIV, but uh, the latest one is called The Quest to Wipe Out a Virus. Okay, and the host of Every Little Thing is Flora Lichtman, and she called me up. But first, a producer called me up to talk to me and made sure I was legit and I could speak. And then after the, I was vetted by the producer, then Flora called me up, and uh, she also spoke with a bunch of other people. This is about eradicating me- er, measles. It's about a half hour, and they also spoke with Roberto Catania and a couple of other people as well. So I listened to it, and I, I end up not getting much out of it, and I don't know if people really like these. I guess people love these kinds of podcasts because they're highly subscribed, and they have lots of ads on their shows. You know, she used to work for Bill Nye, and she worked for the New York Times. She worked for Science Friday. So she's a a um, radio journalist, right? But I don't know. I'd uh, rather hear people talking without the music in between and get a little more substance out of it. But uh, I understand people like this. Anyway, if you want to hear more of us talking about measles, you should check that out. And you could check out the podcast in general. Uh, I would like to say, however, it would be nice if they had promoted TWIV or TWIM or TWIP or whatever, right? Imagine, oh, Rack and Yellow does this cool virus podcast. You should check it out. No, nothing. And there are no show notes whatsoever, okay? Mm. You go to the website and that's it, the, the audio file. And so there's no opportunity. In fact, someone, a listener, Tarwin, had written, just heard you on every little thing. Hope you get the gimlet bump. And I wrote back and said, no, they don't even tell you where to go and nobody's going to search. So why don't these podcasts... Help out other podcasts. Oh, I know. They don't want to share their audience, of course. <laughs> <laughs> now, now. No, the thing is, Alan, we're happy to share stuff, right? That's yes, the pick I of know, the week. I know. Yep. Of course, um, it's more likely yep. that you could get a Gimlet bump than a Twiv bump, although the Twiv bump is cool, right? No. No, I'm not nasty. Is, it's just a little frustrating. That's what, one, what, of their, uh, one of their podcasts here, they have a, a suite of them. One of them is called... Science versus. Mm-hmm. I don't know and what it that says is. Science, science takes on, or science capital V little s, of which I take as versus. Mm-hmm. It says science versus takes on fads, trends, and the opinionated mob to find out what's fact, what's not, and what's somewhere in between. This season we tackle organic food, attachment parenting, gun control, fracking, and more. Mm. Hosted by Wendy Zuckerman. That sounds interesting. Check it out. Could be good. But obviously that feature, that format of, you know, half hour, highly produced, people like that. You know, it's definitely mm-hmm. the NPR style. It's like an sure. en- listening to NPR. And people yeah. obviously love it. But I, I personally come away not learning a lot, and I don't need to be entertained. I would like to hear, I like hearing people talk and being funny, you know, and all that. But I don't need to be entertained with music clips. And that's why I don't like, what is it, uh Radio Lab? Radio Lab. Too much production. All right, I don't mean to complain, but you do want to hear my opinions, no? Not, not sure. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Besides, it's your podcast. You can say what you yeah. want. Well, if no one listens, I can't, right? <laughs> <laughs> the other pick is an article in Tech Dirt. FCC ignores the will of the public votes to begin dismantling net neutrality. Now, we use the net extensively in communicating, obviously. It has made communications really... Uh, you can do things you couldn't do before, blogging, podcasting, social media. And now 
it's going to get wrecked. Surprising absolutely nobody, the FCC today voted two to one along strict party lines to begin dismantling net neutrality protections for consumers. The move comes despite the fact that the vast majority of non-bot comments filed with the FCC support keeping the rules intact. And while the FCC boss Ajit Pai has breathlessly insisted he intended to listen to the concerns of all parties involved, there's been zero indication that this was a serious commitment as he begins dismantling all manner of broadband consumer protections, not just net neutrality. As you might have expected, the FCC was quick to release a statement claiming that gutting the popular yep. consumer protections would usher forth a magical age of connectivity, investment, and innovation. Yeah. Really sad. And in fact, I think we've already had a magical age of connectivity, investment, and innovation. And this is just all about money, right? Yep. Yeah, very frustrating. Reversing all the progress of the past years. Okay, so that is our picks. And then we have a listener pick from Robert. Dear, hi, Dr. Twiv. My name is Robert. I am a cell and molecular biology master's student finishing up my first year at San Diego State University. Oh, so you must know Stan Malloy. And Elio Schechter has a kind of an adjunct thing there. I work in Dr. Roland Wolkowitz's virology lab where I'm in the process of developing a cell-based assay to monitor the proteolytic cleavage of the Zika virus proteome. The weather here is sunny and 23 degrees Celsius. I began listening to Twiv about a year ago and have been working my way through the archives in both directions. <laughs> <laughs> my pick is for a science communication project that I just completed as an end-of-term presentation in one of my graduate classes where we were tasked with the project of explaining a research in a way the general public could understand. We used a really cool presentation technology called Learning Glass, where the speaker faces the audience and writes on a large transparent glass whiteboard. There is a camera in the audience that films the speaker as they write and uses a computer program to flip the image and display it on a multitude of TV screens in the room so the presenter uh, can write while facing the audience. It's a really awesome technology I wasn't aware of and helps to easily convey a message. Anyway, I think this is a great idea to use to help portray the important work that academic labs perform in a way that is easy to get across to an audience that aren't necessarily experts in the science field. I've attached the Dropbox of my presentation. Although the presentation might not be the best out of my class, I'm very proud of the work. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you all for such a great podcast. It keeps me sane while doing homemade site mutagenesis, cloning, and countless hours of tissue culture experiments. Best to you, Robert. So for us to see, I guess. So maybe I I started to watch this, and this board is really cool. Yeah, the board is. I, cool. I didn't have enough time to watch all of it, but what I've seen so far is good. And and this board, it's set up like you said, so you can write on it, but you're behind it, and well, it's easy. So you're uh, facing you're the just, audience. Yeah. Just you just flip the image, uh, and it's it. It's it's very simple to do in uh, on video. Right. So if you have yeah. a pane of if you have a large pane of glass, yeah. then you just draw on it and you um, flip the video mirror image. The cool thing is that you're facing the camera, idea. right? Because yes. in a typical That's lecture, you're facing the board. You turn around. It's kind of awkward. Right. And if you've ever watched these iBio seminar things, they put the person in front of a green screen and they are awkwardly looking at a monitor on the floor and then trying to point at the green screen to where the image will be. This is so much better. Yeah. This is nice. This is cool. I would yeah. do this for sure. I like this technology. The older technology was the overhead transparency projector, yes. which is yeah. how yes. I, what I like to use in my teaching. So. Yep, yep. That's a good one too. But this, of course, is um, get a lot more uh, real estate here to, mm -hmm. to do this. Yeah. I don't know if Robert wants us to uh, <sighs> spread this, but I'll ask him and see if he answers by the Sunday because... He should put it on YouTube, actually. He should put it on YouTube. Yeah. yeah, much easier. All right, that's 442, which is another good number, right? Sure. Because it's, well, it just sounds good. It's an, it's an even number, and yeah. 442, you know, for reason. Ah, 442 is a video format. That's what I'm thinking of. It's a color oh. space, right? Anyone oh. know? Yeah. I don't know that. If you do 4 42 there's 444 and 422. Oh, there's no 442? Okay. Yeah, there's 444 four, four and 422. It's not 442. Okay, forget it. <laughs> anyway, this is TWIV442. You can find it at Apple Podcasts and microbe.tv slash TWIV. Please send us your questions 
and comments to twiv at microbe.tv and consider supporting what we do. According to Tim Requarth, we're doing okay. We're not doing anything wrong. So support us. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute, and we would be eternally grateful for any kind of financial support you could send our way. We have a number of ways you can do it, including Patreon. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. You can also find him on the Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Thanks. Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Do you like Tim? Yeah, it was great talking to him. It was him. good, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rich Condit is an emeritus professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. The introductory music on TWIV is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Uh, your granddaughter's not there, is she, uh, Rich? No, unfortunately. We'll get her another time and get her to do the sign-off. <laughs> You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Got some nice titles here. I like the New York Tim. That's just great. All the nerve that's fit to print. Blinded me with anti-science, practicing a skeptic technique, anti-inflammatory responses. Would you data science denier? Deficit? Would you data? Would you data science denier? Would you data science denier? I like that one. Would you, what, I don't oh, get I didn't get it until you guys read it as date. Uh, yeah. Would you date a science denier? Got it. Right. Deficit mode, the deficit crock. I don't know. I kind of like the New York Tim. Yeah. Sure. Let's get his name in the title. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>